چستم ام حالی اسپندیاری در دیرکتر آف در میدلیس پروگرام Uh, welcome to today's meeting on after Annapolis, where do we go from here? Uh, we are delighted to have with us today uh, Salai Merider, the Israeli ambassador to the United States, and Afif Safiya, the head of the Palestinian Liberation Organization mission to the U.S. Uh, as most of you know, the Wilson Center is a nonpartisan institution engaged in the study of national and world affairs. The center provides a link between the world of ideas and the world of policy. Today's meeting is part of the Joseph and Alma Gildenhorn Middle East Forum of the Middle East Program. The forum was founded in August 2004 and this is the seventh meeting of this important seminar series. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Ambassador Gildenhorn, the chairman of uh, the board of the Wilson Center, and thank him and Mrs. Gildenhorn for their unequivocal support they have been giving to the Middle East program. Um, I would like uh, to extend a special welcome to the, some of the members of the Wilson Council who are attending this meeting, and we are delighted to have with us the Brazilian ambassador. Thank you for coming. The meeting will be moderated by my colleague Aaron David Miller, a public policy scholar at the Wilson Center. Uh, for the previous two decades, Aaron served at the Department of State as an advisor to six secretaries of state where he helped formulate U.S. policy on the Middle East. Most recently as the senior advisor for Arab-Israeli uh, negotiations. Aaron is the author of the forthcoming book, The Much Too Promised Land, America's Elusive Search for Arab-Israeli Peace, it really is a must read. I had the privilege to read it as a manuscript. So, and we will have a big book launch for him here, so please make sure to come. Um, once again, thank you all for coming to this important meeting, and please let me remind you to turn off your cell phones. Hala, thank you for that overly generous introduction. And Hala, I must say, every time I see you, it's really good to have you back. Uh, uh, good morning and welcome to the Wilson Center's Middle East Forum. I think it's very appropriate that the subtitle of this session is a question. Where do we go from here? Because I think in the wake of Annapolis, what we have is a lot of questions. Was Annapolis the most expensive photo opportunity in the history of Arab-Israeli peacemaking, or is it the first step toward a serious negotiating process designed to produce an agreement? Is it a negotiating process of the brave, where American, Israeli, and Palestinian leaders are ready to make tough decisions? Or is it a negotiating process of the afraid, driven by domestic politics, uh, and fear of Iran and Hamas. Will there be a focus on the Israeli-Palestinian track, or will we, we be surprised by the prospective resumption of Israeli-Syrian negotiations? And finally, what will the role of the United States be in this process? Broker, facilitator, monitor, mediator. To help us sort through this muddle, um, we're honored to have two very distinguished guests and presenters. To my left, Salai Meridor. Israel's ambassador to the United States, and to his left, Afif Safiya, Ambassador Safiya, the head of the PLO's mission here in Washington. Both were born in Jerusalem. Both are astute analysts of Arab-Israeli peacemaking, uh, and both have an enormous amount of diplomatic experience, and I'm honored to count both of them as friends. The format today is very simple. Uh, and I will ensure, um, rather than in enforce it, that it, that it be respected. 
Um, each of our presenters will speak no more than eight minutes. As the only American on the panel, I'll offer a minute or two, no more, uh, on the nature of the American role. I may ask a question, which is my prerogative as, mo as moderator, and then we will get uh, to the discussion and hopefully what will be a very lively and informative uh, Q&A. Uh, so with that in mind, Ambassador Mary Dorr, the podium is yours. My dear friend Joe, Ale, welcome. Afif, friend and colleague, and uh, dear, dear friend Aaron, uh, dear friends, thank you for coming in such a great day of snow uh, to listen uh, to what uh, Afif and uh, myself uh, may have to offer. It's a great honor to be at the Wilson uh, Center in a place named after uh, a great American president who uh, has been a great supporter of uh, the Zionist dream uh, when he was president and after he was president. I'm not sure that if he were aware of the concessions Israel is going to make for peace, he would have uh, condoned with it because uh, if you look at what he wrote about the boundaries Israel would need, and when he was thinking about the territory of the future uh, uh, Jewish land, uh, I'm not sure, but Israel is going to make uh, uh, an attempt, a very serious one, to uh, bring about a historic compromise between us and the Palestinians, uh, creating two states uh, west of the Jordan River, uh, living in peace, security, and dignity uh, next to each other. Uh, Annapolis, uh, was it a good, positive event or not so much? I thought it was a very positive event. I think it was an international statement for peace, for a two-state solution. Uh, it was uh, uh, a very good day, uh, I think, for both America, the Palestinian and Israel. For America, because the world saw, if you want, that only America can. For the Palestinians, because uh, so many Arab countries came in support of the leadership uh, of uh, President Abbas and uh, Salam Fayyad. And for Israel, because of the presence of uh, the Arab states and because we are happy uh, to launch this effort. One could ask, uh, why? Uh, why is Israel at this stage uh, launching uh, launching this effort? And uh, I won't hide from you that uh, there are concerns in Israel, and I'd say quite justified, given the experience of the last seven years, from the failure of Kum David uh, to uh, the terror attack uh, that <coughs> we uh, were uh, uh, victims of, uh, to the Palestinian reaction to the disengagement uh, Still, while walking in the halls inside, I got a report of another Qassam rocket falling on a house in Shderot. Uh, the Palestinian elections voting uh, Hamas in, the takeover, uh, the current situation that uh, some would suggest there isn't enough strength to deliver a compromise and the implementation of a compromise. So there is a list of concerns and uh, hesitations uh, uh, that uh, Israelis have, uh, but at the same time, and this is uh, 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 the reason why we are going to engage very seriously in this process, we don't want to miss an opportunity, if there is an opportunity. And uh, we do not want to ignore uh, the development within the Palestinian society where there is a government that is Hamas-free, that is terror-free, that is led by people who uh, uh, are genuine about their uh, desire uh, to live in peace. Uh, we uh, uh, are not uh, uh, sure it is smart uh, to wait, uh, given the trends that are quite negative in the region, and given the fact that uh, uh, what if we waited and we'd have only Hamas to deal with, would that get us any better? Uh, uh, it wouldn't be, in our view, smart to ignore the signals 
uh, small signals, but signals uh, uh, from the Arab world. And largely because basically Israel decided strategically that this is what we want. We want to reach a compromise, historic compromise, that is leading to uh, two states living side by side, as I, as I mentioned. So uh, yes, we are concerned. Yes, we see the difficulties. Yes, we are aware of uh, of, of what's on the ground. Uh, however, we are going to uh, not close our eyes on the concerns, but uh, uh, drive with hope, with open eyes uh, forward. What would it take? Uh, it would take, obviously, uh, a very difficult compromise on the Israeli side uh, of almost rewriting our narrative, uh, of telling our own people uh, that land that was promised to us from the Bible will be given up to the Palestinians forever, uh, telling ourselves and Jews that they will be able to return to only one part of this land and not to the other part of this land, uh, uproot uh, a significant number of people who are of the best Israel has, go through an internal nightmare, uh, but we know that we have to go through all of this in order to give a chance uh, uh, for another day for us and for the Palestinians. But it would take two to tango. And it would take on the part of the Palestinians, uh, on the one hand, build, sorry, build bottom up, because if we only stay at the top, uh, talking uh, horizons without uh, a partner uh, being built that can sign an agreement and deliver on the agreement, we may not be able to uh, move forward. That has to do with government and services and law and order and fighting terror and different things that would consist uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, a government, a neighbor that can uh, deliver on, uh, on an agreement. And they would have to uh, mutually agree to uh, compromise on difficult things for them. Uh, having the dream fulfilled only in part of the land, uh, just like yeah. us. Having the people return only to part of the land, just like us. Understanding uh, uh, Israel's security needs. Understanding the special connection between the Jewish people and Jerusalem. So each of us would have to make our own share in, in compromising. And I said two to tango. In this case, there could be three to tango. And these are the Arab uh, uh, countries. And they can play a very uh, supportive role if they choose so. We are happy that they came to Annapolis. We hope that this would not be for them a one-time event nor a photo opportunity. They could have a significant impact on creating an atmosphere of peace, of supporting the Palestinian leadership, of creating for them the environment for compromise and for uh, building what they need to build, for extending hand to Israel, through their population, changing their educational systems in terms of recognizing Israel and educate for peace, create rela relationship, contacts with Israelis, something that their population sees, Israelis sees, as part of trying to tr transform this region uh, to something that is uh, less dangerous and with more hope. So uh, to sum it up, we are starting and a very difficult uh, uh, journey. And I don't want to suggest this is going to be something easy. <clears throat> and I don't want to suggest that I know what the chances are for success. I know that we don't want, do not want to lose the opportunity, small or big, and we do think that there is an opportunity. I know that we are going to be with open eyes, but make every effort to uh, reach an agreement reach a compromise, reach peace for us and for our neighbors. Thank you. Ambassador Sophia. Thank you, Aaron. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege for me to be today in this prestigious institution, the Woodrow Wilson Center, to be in front of such a distinguished audience and to appear on a panel 
with Ambassador Salai Meridor. The first time we met was a few months ago when we both visited the summer camp of the Seeds of Peace in May, and we both addressed youngsters from Israel and Palestine. And I remember my message to them then was to say, please do get involved. History is usually undecided. Help history make the right choice. I remembered in front of them how I grew up politically in the golden era of the student movement when we had several mottos then. One, that politics is too important to be left to politicians. Number two, that one should take care of politics because politics anyway takes care of us. And number three, I remember having told them, don't, don't allow our generation to colonize the future, our generation to colonize colonize your generation by making you inherit a world of occupation, belligerency, violence, and war. Ladies and gentlemen, I still remember some years ago when Fukuyama published his book, The End of History. André Fontaine, then a senior editor in Le Monde in Paris, wrote an editorial which he concluded by saying, if it's really true that we are living the end of history, then we are witnessing the beginning of boredom. Well, I would welcome a few moments of boredom because I always bear in mind what, was, what the Swiss used to say during the Napoleonic Wars that devastated continental Europe. Les peuples heureux n'ont pas d'histoire. Happy peoples have no history. And we both belong to societies that are either burdened or blessed with too much history. Ladies and gentlemen, Annapolis. Was it a spectacular non-event or was it the beginning of a revitalized, credible diplomatic avenue? Let me tell you again, history is undecided. Yet I believe today, ladies and gentlemen, there are two camps, what, which I call the forces of immobilism and the factors and the vehicles for change. Let me start with the factors and the vehicles for change. One, I'm delighted to see an American involvement at the highest possible level by President Bush and Dr. Rice, Secretary of State. I think that we have seen and witnessed six years of neglect, but now I can see involvement. And I, for one, who have had the privilege of seeing both of them several times in the last two months, I believe in their sincerity. And I say it as a person who has many a grievance and a reservation on other policy options that were made during the last years. On that particular issue, I believe they are sincere. Sincere when Condoleezza Rice two months ago said the creation of a Palestinian state is an American national interest. That was a major statement. I believe her when she said failure should not be an option. I believe President Bush when he said she represents me, she speaks for me, we are two in one. And I believe President Bush who told us in New York in September, I'm growing increasingly impatient with the absence of progress. And since we have become unreasonably reasonable, I believe that his impatience is not directed to myself side of the argument. I believe this is a factor and a vehicle for change. A factor and a vehicle for change which is accompanied by what I consider to be maturation within American public opinion. I believe many an opinion poll scientifically conducted revealed in the last two years that there is a comfortable majority in America for an even-handed American approach. There is a comfortable majority in favor of the creation of the Palestinian state. There is a comfortable majority within the American Jewish community, even higher than the national average for the two-state solution. All these I perceive as encouraging factors, and one should not always see the cup half empty, but the cup half full. And I always say to my Palestinian interlocutors, it's only the optimists who make history, not the pessimism. And I always say to some of my interlocutors, I'm not in favor of those who have elevated pessimism as the only criteria of measurement of one's patriotism. No, only optimists, but credible, serious, pragmatic uh, optimists make history. I believe that in this country, too, uh, books that have appeared in the last 12 months, Carter, The Two Professors, etc., show also that there is now an opening up of the debate in this country, and this is a very positive evolution. I, for one, have constantly spoken to Palestinian and Arab audiences that the American Jewish community is not monolithic, it's diverse and it's fascinating. And as I told you, a majority, comfortable majority within the American Jewish community are today uh, in favor of the two-state solution. Uh, I just came back from New York where I was a keynote speaker in the annual conference of the Israel Policy Forum with Ephraim Sneh from the Israeli Knesset.
I believe that unfortunately there is a Christian wing in this country that is not playing a very helpful role, and I being from a Christian background, I believe that their delirious theology is an embarrassment for Christianity, for Christians, and mainly those who come from the West Bank and uh, the Holy Land, and I keep saying to some of them, each time I hear you, I feel the need of defending the innocence of God. <laughs> the, other, the, other, the other vehicle or factor of uh, optimism is, I believe, the involvement of the international community. And I was with Ambassador Meridor in Annapolis. Believe you me, the who is who of international diplomacy was there in Annapolis. Over 40 senior foreign ministers were in Annapolis. It was the world as our witness. And they were not only there as observers, they all desired to become players and participants. I know for a fact, having spent most of my life in Europe, that Europe is annoyed to have been relegated only as a payer and that they would die of the desire of being a player, and we invite them. We always say, I always said to Europeans, Europe is still an actor in search for a role. We in the Middle East, we have a role in search of an actor. If we could merge the two, we will all live less unhappily. The other factor and vehicle of hope is the Arab involvement. The Saudi initiative does not go back only to this year, 2007, not even to 2002. I will trace it back to 81, 82, because before the Abdullah plan, some of you remember, there was the Fahid plan that was not very different from the Abdullah plan. And I believe that today in the Arab world, from Morocco on the Atlantic to Muscat in Oman on the Indian Ocean, we are ready for the historical compromise. If Israel withdraws out of its, its 67 expansion, the Arab world is in favor of recognizing Israel in its pre-67 existence, another factor for change. Now, in America, I told you about the maturation of public opinion. My message for the last two years was to tell America, we are not inviting America to sacrifice a traditional friend. We are offering America an additional one, Palestine. Number two, we have understood the message throughout the last decades that America is committed to Israel's existence. But is America committed to Israel's expansion? I doubt. In Israel, there is a vibrant debate about the wisdom, the sacacity, and the desirability of keeping the hilltops of the West Bank. But what is America's interest in Israel keeping the hilltops of the West Bank? None. I believe in America, and you are probably proof of that, there is a growing feeling among the knowledgeable community that the unresolved question of Palestine is what has poisoned international relations. And I believe that American involvement in finding the solution is a key to America's acceptability, respectability, and I will even say we, the Palestinians, are the key for America's lovability around the world. Now, I said there are forces of immobilism, ladies and gentlemen. I have been converted to Israeli-Palestinian years since decades, and I always say that probably we too, our societies, might have preferred to have the Norwegians as our immediate neighbors. That's a scenario that is not on offer. We are in a situation of unavoidable yet unhappy coexistence, and we should explore every possible avenue for a more civilized, decent uh, cohabitation. I always say that Israel was supposed to be a solution to what was called the Jewish question, and as a result today, we are the question awaiting the answer. And the dilemma is there is either one people too many in the Middle East, this time we the Palestinians, or there is a state which is missing. And I believe the verdict of the international community is that there is a state missing, not a people too many. Now, the verdict of history is still undecided. And I always say the oppressed are not necessarily, through a process of predetermination, victorious. History is a cemetery of oppressed people who remained oppressed until they vanished into historical oblivion. I'll end, ladies and gentlemen, by saying that I hope that our societies, and not only our societies, will be governed tomorrow, not by politicians, but by statesmen. What's the difference between a politician and a statesman? A politician is an individual who cannot resist the temptation of an immediate gain, even if he or she sacrifices a mid-term, long-term advantage. And the statesman is a person who can look condescendingly at an immediate advantage in favor of the long-term, medium-term gain. I hope we will be governed by statesmen and not by mere politicians. I believe today, and I'll be ending, Aaron, on that one, that the Israeli political leadership is unaware of the tremendous moral crisis traversing Jewish communities in Western Europe and America. 
Jewish minorities, Jewish community have always been at the forefront of enlightenment, civil rights, human rights. Yet, because of what has happened and the way it has happened in the Middle East, they were reduced into defending the indefensible. I can feel, I can sense, and I have my finger on the pulse that many Jewish Americans and many European Jews are uncomfortable today and are traversing an interesting moral crisis that the Israeli leadership seems to be unaware of. Number two, I believe the Israeli leadership should become aware that we, the Palestinians, are the key for the regional acceptance of Israel. And peace, security come from regional acceptance, not from territorial aggrandizement. The theories of strategic depth are today dépassé, déplacé, and all the rest. Number three, I believe that Israeli public opinion should be made aware that the perpetuation of the conflict is not due to Arab rejection of Israeli existence, but to Israeli rejection of Arab acceptance. And I hope that I offer you this as food for thought. My last comment would be to say the following. I, as a peace enthusiast, would say that the obstacle, the impediment to peacemaking has not been terrorism, which I have constantly, consistently condemned, but territory, meaning the territorial appetite. I'll end by saying, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm fully in favor of peace. I believe we have a window of opportunity. I've seen in the last 16 years since Madrid, 14 years since Oslo, many a desirable breakthrough and many a devastating breakdown. I believe we can no more afford a breakdown. We, in the peace process and in the period where we were pre-negotiating negotiations, we have explored every possible scenario, every alternative, every option, and their opposite, ad nauseum. If there were a political willingness, I believe that it is doable, achievable, possible, desirable, and in the lapse of time of, 19, of the year 2008. The end of history I started with, I believe the completion of the peace process will be the end of prehistory, and I hope that 2009 will be Palestine year one. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we, the Palestinians, and I take a commitment in front of you, we are ready to respect all our commitments to the international community. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that now is time for the international community to respect its commitments towards the Palestinian people. And I believe in international relations, the international will should prevail on a national whim. And Ambassador Meridor, you've heard me say before, but what do you want? I'm consistent in what I believe in. I believe that a territory that was occupied in six days can also be evacuated in six days so that the Israelis can rest on the seventh and we can engage in the fascinating journey of uh, nation building and economic recovery. Thank you. Afif, thank, Afif, thank you very much. Um, let me offer a, a few observations on, on the American role and be very brief. Number one, if this process is going to be serious, like most of the other serious efforts toward Arab-Israeli peacemaking, it's going to have to be driven by the locals. There's no, there's no way of getting around that. And you can't make bricks without straw. And unless the political will and skill is there and the commitment, there's not much the United States can be able to do. At the same time, our role is going to be extremely important. Number two, it's taken the Bush administration almost seven years to get to this point. But it has crossed two very important thresholds, it seems to me. And this does not prejudge whether or not this process will be serious or not. Uh, it's, that's still very much an open question. Number one, it's abandoned, at least temporarily, the notion that you can resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict through transformational, transformational diplomacy, that is to say regime change, a focus only on security and democratization. It has now shifted back to where American policy on the Arab-Israeli conflict has been for many years the transactional approach. Not transformational, but transactional. That is to say, in order to resolve this conflict, democratization, security, and regime change may be important, but you're going to have to deal with the core issues. And number two, it is bought into the concept of process. When I worked for Colin Powell for two years, the word peace process was literally banned from the lexicon of, of the Department of State. Uh, and there's a story there as well. But they have they have now come to understand that a process is only another way of describing managing a problem that you can't resolve now. Number three, I would argue there are two key indicators 
about whether or not this process is going to be serious and whether or not it's going to work. Number one, will Israelis and Palestinians with and or without U.S. help be able to negotiate, not a peace treaty by the end of 08, not the creation of a Palestinian state by the end of 08. Those are completely, my judgment, unrealizable, unachievable objectives. But can Israelis and Palestinians in the next year negotiate what you could describe as a framework agreement, an agreement 10, 15 pages that addresses how the four core issues that drive the Israeli-Palestinian conflict will, will be resolved, security, borders, Jerusalem, and refugees. That, to me, will be extremely difficult to achieve. It is possible, but it, it will be a measure of whether or not this process is succeeding. And second, hand in hand with the negotiators and the paper, must come a fundamental change of the situation on the ground. Normal human beings no longer believe in this. And a way has to be found to demonstrate in the real world, in the real world of Israeli and Palestinian politics on the ground, in Israel, the West Bank, in Gaza, in Jerusalem, that things are changing. The formal way of describing that is, will the parties be able, this time, with American prodding, encouragement, reassurance, and also, I suspect, some pressure, take on their responsibilities to implement even the first phase of, of the roadmap. Finally, um, there are two huge problems that stand out here. On the Palestinian side, it's a divided Palestinian house. And whether it's the District of Columbia or Chevy Chase, Maryland, where I live, or the government of Sweden or Egypt, unless an authority maintains control over the monopoly of the forces of violence, in short, unless it, can, it maintains control over all of the guns, it can never be respected by its own citizens, let alone its neighbors. That is the single greatest challenge that confronts, in my judgment, the process in the Palestinian house what to do about Hamas. On the Israeli side, different political system, but a problem nonetheless, and that is this. Can an internal consensus be created within Israel which creates a measure of agreement on what it is the Israelis want to achieve and what price they are prepared to pay for it? Because the notion that you can do this peace process on the cheap, the notion that you can somehow split, split up these issues as if they were pieces of salami, is simply not a reality. And it's an illusion to believe that you can do these agreements, Jerusalem, borders, refugees, and security, without coming very, very close to what the parties need. Finally, above all, for the Bush administration, there ought to be a diplomatic equivalent of the Hippocratic Oath, which is basically, above all, do no harm. Whether or not this framework agreement gets done by the end of 08, whether or not there's a change on the ground, the Bush administration needs to pass to its successor, Democrat or Republican, a <coughs> process that actually is working and that has some prospect of hope. Because the consequences of the alternative have been all too obvious in the last transition. So let me stop there and ask my first question before we get to yours. To Salai and Afif, if you had to identify one action in this world, not out of this world, but in this world, that your respective governments um, would hope could change the attitudes of Israelis and Palestinians, what would it be? First to you, Afif, what one action could Israel take that would convince you that there is a serious commitment and Salai, the opposite to you? Uh, th thank you, Aaron. Uh, Aaron, I believe we have always to bear in mind, and it's not to score a point, that it's Israel that occupies Palestine and not Palestine that occupies Israel. So Israel can take many an action to change the political environment in which we operate. Uh, 
The reality, sir, today is extremely grim. I was reminded by my colleague Nabil before we came here that in November only we had 36 Palestinians killed, and since Annapolis up to today, 16 Palestinians killed. Yes, we have had a few releases of prisoners, but the total number of those incarcerated during the process of freeing those prisoners increased the total number of prisoners because they exceed the number. Uh, the checkpoints, uh, we were promised that uh, we will have freedom of mobility for people and product. The UN monitoring uh, devices have discovered that we are having 50 more additional roadblocks since we started the blah, blah, blah about Annapolis. So I would, if I were an Israeli, I would, for example, free en masse Palestinian prisoners so that every Palestinian city, village, refugee camp, and extended family can have many returnees back home. And this will create a fantastic psychological positive shock in my society about the believability of the process we are trying to re-trigger. And let me tell you, sir, Israeli academic research have proven that very few, and when I say very few, less than five, one hand, uh, have re-engaged once liberated and freed from prison, re-engaged in violent activity for a variety of reasons. In prison, people mature. In prison, people age. When they are released, they want to pick up their life where it was abandoned or start a life that never really took off the ground. If I were an Israeli, I would release en masse Palestinian prisoners as a signal towards a change of environment. And I believe, sir, not only in peace, I believe in reconciliation. And if I were an Israeli, I would advocate and lobby for Israeli graceful behavior. I would hesitate to use the word magnanimous that was used at Ori at Raver, but graceful Israeli behavior towards the Palestinians is something to be encouraged today and tomorrow. Thanks, Afif. Salai. Uh, thank you, uh, Afif. Uh, in, in, in friendship, uh, I have to admit I'm somewhat troubled by, uh, by your suggestions. Uh, for graceful behavior? You prefer the opposite? It's your choice. Of your, of your definition of graceful behavior. Uh, releasing of prisoners is basically releasing of terrorists. None of them sitting in jail uh, because uh, they were uh, crossing the street uh, when the light was, uh, was red. These are people whose purpose and action was to take the lives of innocent people. And that, uh, uh, the attempt will be made to build uh, an ethos on releasing people who, have, who are murderers, most of them, by the way, Hamas people, is troubling to me. I think we should all look inside and see how we can change ourselves in order to transform situations. It is so-called Israeli occupation of Palestine. We went out of Gaza, didn't leave there one soldier, nor have we left them one Israeli, without asking for any concession. Today we count uh, this year the number 2,000 rockets launched from Gaza on Israeli innocent civilians. So uh, they both uh, start with R, but there is a difference between rhetoric and, and, re and reality. What I would love to see is a change in the Palestinian Authority for them and for us. Not only for us, for them and for us. That, uh, responding to your, uh, to your question, Aaron, that they build a government that is trusted by their own people, that provides services to their own people, that is not corrupt, that is uh, providing for law and order, that is uh, uh, cracking down on terror. This is the only way Israelis can be convinced that they can trust a neighbor. And we want to trust the neighbor.
and we want to do everything we can in order to help this grow and be built. Now we are far from there. And I don't suggest it's about the intentions. But at the end of the day, life is not only about intentions. It's about capacities. And uh, you may know that only uh, five uh, months ago, when our Prime Minister decided to go and visit President Abbas in Jericho, people of the Palestinian National uh, Security Forces were uh, planning to attack the uh, uh, convoy of the Prime Minister. And they were arrested after we were advising the Palestinian Authority of that development. But in September they were released. Now do I think that anybody upstairs ordered their release? Absolutely not. And when they were, their attention has been called to the fact that uh, terrorists who planned maybe even to assassinate Israel Prime Minister, visiting them in their city, they were rearrested. Two weeks ago, an Israeli was, uh, was murdered by three uh, Palestinian terrorists. They were not Hamas people. Two of them were members of the Palestinian Authority security guards, the current. So this is the reality of life. And if we want to build on peace, yes, and this is what Israel is so forthcoming in, in change from the roadmap. Yes, we want to discuss the political outcome. Yes, we want to create political horizon. Yes, we are upfront on our readiness to make very painful compromises. But if we don't want this to just float up there, there must be change on the ground. And what is critical, and you allowed me only one, so what's critical for us and for the Palestinians is that the talk will move into walk and that the walk would be serious for them and for us. So I thank you very much. You've been very patient and let's, uh, let's go to your questions now. Yes, wait, wait for the mic, please, thank you. Uh, John Salzberg, Washington Interfaith Alliance for Middle East Peace. Uh, concerning the rockets that come into northern Israel, Israel has every right to defend itself. But there are certain restrictions under the Geneva Conventions on the laws of war, and that is not to punish the civilian innocent people. You talk about taking lives of innocent people. That's what Israel's doing now, denying water, denying electricity, medical supplies. People are dying as a result of the collective form of punishment Israel's taking and it also reflects on how, how, how do you expect to bring Hamas into the picture when you are, you are obviously alienating people. I appreciate comments from any of the panelists. Who else you would like to thoughts? Well, the first part, perhaps you and then Afif on Hamas. Okay, uh, uh, first of all, let's start with the facts. The facts are that even though Israel is not responsible for Gaza anymore, Israel is providing Gaza with electricity, with water, allowing for uh, uh, necessary needs for humanitarian purposes to go into Gaza. So uh, I would first of all suggest that you just uh, check your, uh, your fact base because while we are talking, electricity to Gaza comes from Israel, water to Gaza comes from Israel, where we don't have any responsibility. But we do care for humanitarian issues. Gaza is serving as a terror base against Israel. This is like having a terror state in uh, Maryland uh, uh, attacking every day with rockets Washington. Or just to be uh, fair, maybe Virginia. Israel cannot sit still and not defend its innocent civilians. And what we are doing is trying to target those who are trying to kill us. 
and will continue to do so. Because we have to protect our people. I think that the fact that Israel, while being attacked from such a hostile entity, unlike many other nations in many other wars, is still providing for the humanitarian needs for the population that, uh, uh, from which the attacks are occurring. A population, by the way, that freely went to the ballots and voted the terrorists in. I would assume Israel should be commended that while defending itself rightly is still caring for the humanitarian needs of its enemies. Afif, do you want to uh, respond to the Hamas question? Uh, I have great respect for the person who has just raised that issue, and I believe that uh, the Israeli unilateral withdrawal out of Gaza was a very ill-advised policy. Uh, one, it was not negotiated with us, uh, so the pragmatic school of thought within Palestinian politics could not say to public opinion, you see, this is a result and a dividend of our strategic option of negotiations. It allowed the other school of thought to say the Israeli redeployment out of Gaza is the result of our successful heroic military resistance, etc. I would have hoped that it was negotiated with us, and I would have hoped that Palestinian society would have seen it as a dividend of negotiations and that strategic choice. The idea behind the unilateral withdrawal out of Gaza was how to improve the grip and the grasp of the Israelis on the West Bank. And while 8,000 were being withdrawn illegal settlers out of Gaza, over 30,000 were being settled in the West Bank. Hence, there was no feeling of goodwill in Palestinian society, unfortunately. I would have liked my society to react differently, but the Israeli approach was not humanitarian, was rather Machiavellic. Salah, your usage of the word humanitarian I find extremely disturbing. If that's humanitarian behavior, please change your style and the attitude because it's extremely devastating for the interest of my society. As I told you, Gaza has been, yes, evacuated from illegal settlers and the army, but Gaza became the greatest open door and open air prison on earth. It's access and borders and boundaries and the freedom of movement of people and products are totally prohibited and in intercepted. It is economically suffocated. Uh, the victims in Gaza, I told you, I spoke of 36 killed in November. Most of them are in the Gaza Strip and not all of them are militants. The targeted uh, policy of targeted uh, killings often have collateral damage of civilians, women, children and elderly. And uh, believe you me, of the 3,000 plus items that were in and out of Gaza in previous months and years, now only 90 items are allowed in to the extent that all the small industry that is in Gaza has had to close shop and it has raised the number of the unemployed and those who live under poverty line. I personally would hope that a bilateral ceasefire can be achieved. And I want to tell you one thing and I have no affinity with Hamas. Hamas has abandoned suicide bombings as a decision taken in consultation with other Palestinian factions two or three years ago. Hamas is not the one now launching rockets. It might inter intercept others who are doing it, but the military value of those rockets are insignificant, and I, for one, have been preaching nonviolence for the Palestinian scene for a variety of reasons, ethical but also pragmatic. I believe that in Israel still there is this attitude of how to provoke the Arabs into provoking us so that we can retaliate <laughs> disproportionately. I believe uh, the usage of the word humanitarian dealing with Gaza is extremely disturbing for me. Afif, but, thank, you, thank you very much. We really, I mean, no. we, okay. there are no, many people who want to ask. Uh, Salai, do, do you want to respond or should we go to another question? Please go. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, uh, Ira Weiss. Uh, I'd like to ask both Ambassador Meridor and Ambassador Safia this question. Uh, suppose, it seems to me that the parameters of a final status agreement are essentially already defined uh, between Taba and President Clinton's 2000 proposals and uh, the Geneva, proposal, Geneva Accord proposals. I think we know pretty much 
what's required, what kind of compromises, those painful compromises that's, that, Merido, that Ambassador Merida spoke of, we know what they are. So the question is, does uh, Prime Minister Olmeret and does President Abbas have the political clout necessary to sign an agreement that would look, that would, that would require such kind of compromises? And even if he could sign it, could he, impl could he implement them? First of all, on the uh, substance, uh, I hope, we all deeply hope that we will be able to reach uh, an agreement on and compromise on the major issues. Uh, we all recognize that all previous uh, attempts have not been successful. Uh, we are not going to be deterred by it. We are going to try again, and this is exactly what we are going to engage in in the coming year. But it's going to be a very difficult exercise for both parties, and uh, we are... Uh, not only willingly, we are excitedly uh, going to go through this exercise, hoping that uh, the Palestinian side uh, will uh, walk with us uh, with the same spirit and hopefully we'll be able to reach, to reach uh, an agreement. Uh, in terms of a political support uh, for uh, an agreement uh, uh, in Israel, at least as polls indicate, uh, the majority of Israeli society would support an agreement which includes compromises on the Israeli part, mutual compromise with the Palestinians or by the Palestinians, if they believe that there is a partner that can uh, really live up to the agreement. And there is skepticism on this, uh, on this uh, uh, last point. And this is why I, I stressed uh, uh, before that we are going here really two processes in parallel, the top down and the bottom up. And uh, they must meet some time uh, somewhere because if we only do the top and there is nothing building from the bottom, it will not be sustainable, or maybe not even uh, reachable. So we want to focus on a two track process in the year 08. We want to do it the, the top down to build the horizon, to make the compromises on both sides, and the bottom up to help the Palestinians build what is necessary for them and for uh, having a neighbor you can live with uh, in peace, security, and dignity. I agree with you that grosso modo all concerned know the parameters of what is desirable and what is possible, <coughs> plus or minus. And uh, I was not encouraged by the Israeli attitude prior to Annapolis when we were trying to seek an agreement on a joint document. If you remember, sir, the Israeli position was reluctant even to enumerate and list the uh, issues of final status. Why? Because domestic Israeli politics was complicated, the coalition was fragile, and Lieberman, for one, has said, if Jerusalem is mentioned and the future of Jerusalem is mentioned, I'm quitting the coalition. And I'm worried on uh, the 11th, 12th of December when the negotiating teams will be designated because we have to engage in intensive negotiations starting from the 12th of December. One of those committees will have to deal with Jerusalem. So it has to be named the Jerusalem Committee. And I wonder what uh, grievance or reluctance will be shown on the other side. To give you an idea, sir, Jerusalem. We believe, like the international community, that uh, Jerusalem should be shared tomorrow. West Jerusalem can become the capital of the Israeli state, the recognized capital of the Israeli state. East Jerusalem, the recognized capital of the Palestinian state. The city can remain undivided. And I use, sir, the word undivided deliberately to avoid using the word united, which was perverted by the annexationists. The world believes that in Jerusalem there are two national aspirations to be satisfied and three religious rights to be respected. And I, for one, believe, like the world, that uh, there is no hierarchy of importance of the three monotheistic religions. They are equally as important, and Jerusalem is symbolically important to the adherents of those three religions. The world does not believe in the hegemony, monopoly, exclusivity of one side in Jerusalem. Yet sharing Jerusalem seems to be problematic for the other side. While the world has said its word about the need to share Jerusalem equitably. And we are ready, sir. This is why I said we are unreasonably reasonable. Arafat in the Camp David talks uh, proposed that the Wailing Wall should become under Israeli sovereignty. The Jewish quarter in the old city of Jerusalem 
will remain under Israeli sovereignty. He spoke of territorial swaps to allow some of the illegal settlements to remain, even though they were illegal and in defiance of international law and in defiance of the international community. We adopted the principle of territorial swaps as a sort of flexibility offered to the other side. The Israeli side in Camp David and beyond asked for sovereignty on the Western Wall, which is 10 times longer than the Wailing Wall. They asked sovereignty also on the Armenian Quarter up to Jaffa Gate, I wonder why, created the concept of the Holy Basin, which in my uh, very profound Christian upbringing never encountered as a concept, etc., etc. So I believe, sir, it's a question of political willingness. And I always say, peace in is too important in the Middle East to be left to either side to decide upon. We should look at international law and international resolutions as our guiding compass. Nobody asked Saddam Hussein to conduct a referendum in Iraq on whether he wanted or they wanted to withdraw out of Kuwait. The word oh, said, Afif, you know, I haven't finished, and you don't grow oh, accustomed in interrupting oh, only me, please. Hopefully soon. Well, right. You have a tendency to go on. Just as a principle, I would like to go one yeah, sentence. I'm not, I'm not interrupting you. Uh, you have a tendency to go on, and we, we're interested in economy of answers and language here. There are many other questions. If it's a equitably insured and enforced, I wouldn't mind, sir, which was not the case. But okay, uh, the floor next is yours. Next question. Yes. Sorry. Dave, Dave Bernstein. There, there were suggestions made a while back in thinking of Jerusalem, of thinking of it as sort of like New York with boroughs, some, as, a, as an end game type thing, how people live in New York with different backgrounds and quite tremendous amount of diversity, but but getting along together, living, uh, trying to live a quality life, uh, how can that vision manifest itself in Jerusalem with uh, Palestinians and Israelis, each with some kind of control mm -hmm. in a dem democratic state? Uh, so, uh, uh, Jerusalem I have special affection for. My family goes back in Jerusalem as far as the archives exist in Jerusalem. And I believe Jerusalem can either be, sir, the reason for and the focus and the stimulus for global dialogue of cultures, civilizations, and religions, or the reason and pretext for the global clash of cultures and civilizations. And I would like it to be the center and the focus of dialogue. Jerusalem is a unique city. It's diverse. It's one and plural a la fois. And it's, that's its richness. Uh, the fact that there are different communities, different cultures, different memories, different histories, enrich Jerusalem rather than impoverish it. And I believe we can live and cohabitate and cross-fertilize agreeably. Uh, to give you an example, sir, we are proud as a Palestinian society the way we hosted uh, Armenian refugees who came to Palestine at the beginning of the 20th century. They are part now of the social national fabric. Many of them play a prominent role in our political, in our cultural life uh, and in our economic life. So yes, it's doable, sir. We have to keep Jerusalem plural and one at the same time. We have to do it on the basis of respect and self-respect. And as I told you, we should abandon the idea that there is a hierarchy of importance in the three religions. No, they are equally as important, just as their adherents are equally as important. And I'm in favor of a two municipality formula with joint municipal committees for points of concern. Why do I say, sir, a two-municipality formula for Jerusalem? Because the Israelis happen to have a demographic obsession, and they keep calculating. After having imposed on us many restrictions, they keep calculating percentages. How, what's the percentage of Palestinians? And by the way, I'm a victim of that policy, because when Israel occupied East Jerusalem and annexed it. I happened to be in university in Europe, so I became legally non-existent because I wasn't there when they occupied. Uh, they tried to always win the battle of numbers. Tomorrow when East Jerusalem will keep, become the Palestinian capital, uh, for reasons of force majeure, demographically, it will expand on the Palestinian side. Why? Because there will be embassies located in East Jerusalem also. There will be the governmental departments, etc. And I don't want the Israelis to worry that we are proliferating in Jerusalem. I don't mind if West Jerusalem becomes a Mediterranean city and expands to the shores of the Mediterranean. And they shouldn't mind if I, my Jerusalem expands to become a, 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 on the Dead Sea. 
And by the way, to tell you the enormity of the compromise, I happen to come from a family that used to belong and live in West Jerusalem before 1948. They had to move, for the reasons you know, from west to east side of Jerusalem. I was born in 1950. In family terms, I was considered as the consolation after the catastrophe. But uh, you can see the enormity of our flexibility and of our concession. I believe Jerusalem, two capitals for two sovereign states, yet undivided, and two municipalities, and respect for the other communities and what Jerusalem means for them. So why do you want to respond, or should we go to another question? I, I, I think that uh, uh, while we have to try and focus on the future, uh, sometime historic perspective uh, is important. Uh, one issue just to mention, uh, as I think uh, all of us know, uh, Israel didn't attack uh, the West Bank in '67. Israel was attacked from the West Bank and in a defensive war uh, relieved itself from an ex existential threat. Iraq was occupying Kuwait, uh, attacking Kuwait, by the way, with the support of uh, the PLO at the time. Uh, so you want to keep Jerusalem as a booty of war. Thank you very I, much. Uh, Fief, let, let, let Salai respond. You, you don't have to be that discouraged because the atmosphere in the discussions uh, that take place in Israel between Israelis and Palestinians is much more optimistic than uh, you may uh, sense, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, in this room. Uh, the, uh, uh, on the issue of Jerusalem, I, uh, I was born in Jerusalem, and I still remember the days when Jerusalem was divided. Uh, I remember the fear of being shot at uh, from uh, uh, the eastern part of Jerusalem. I remember the day of the morning of the Six Days War when my mother took me from school, crawling uh, back home. I remember sitting at home when shells were uh, at a, uh, uh, hitting uh, apartments in our neighborhood. And I remember that uh, the three religions were not treated equally when uh, only Jews uh, could not go to visit their holiest places. And luckily, as of 67, all three religions can experience and exercise freedom of worship uh, in, in Jerusalem. I don't think it will be helpful to try and negotiate uh, the issue of Jerusalem right here. Uh, it is definitely a very difficult issue for both parties. Uh, I hope it is appreciated what Jerusalem with the history of more than 3,000 years means for the Jewish people. And I hope that we will be wise enough to find both sides uh, uh, a solution that uh, uh, will be workable for both us and, uh, and the Palestinians. Uh, this is looking forward. Uh, we should, on the one hand, not forget what brought us here, but uh, look forward uh, to see how we can uh, uh, resolve difficult issues and uh, transform the situation. So uh, this question come, is for you from uh, our, one of the rooms downstairs. Um, can you address the... Um, role of um, the Arab countries in prospects for normalization with Israel? As I said at the beginning, I think that they could play uh, a major role, and I hope that they will play a major role. Uh, by the way, both uh, for the Palestinians uh, and for us. Uh, for the Palestinians, it is by supporting uh, their uh, moderate leadership and be unequivocal on not dancing with uh, Hamas. It is by providing financial assistance. It is by providing moral uh, 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 support for compromise, and in terms of the relation for Israel, it is really in uh, in uh, taking very uh, basic steps that I would assume that everybody uh, in this room would look at just as uh, as natural. And this is unfortunate that they have not yet been taken, and I hope that they will be taken. Uh, what will it take for them to uh, uh, educate for peace uh, in the textbooks? What will it take for them to uh, put Israel on their maps? Uh, what will it take for them to have visits of Israelis to their countries or their representatives to Israel? 
what will it take for them to uh, uh, have meetings, even in the third place, of between Israelis and uh, representatives of their countries. Opening uh, offices, uh, not yet maybe uh, embassies, but offices. They can contribute a lot to a dynamics for peace uh, in the Middle East. And uh, it is important uh, uh, for the Palestinians, in my humble opinion. It is important for the Israelis. I hope it is important enough for them that they would not sit on the fence anymore, go beyond talking a talk, but really uh, walk the walk of peace. Uh, next question. Yes. First, thank both of you gentlemen for being here and responding to questions. Diasporas have played very important roles in conflict. Uh, Northern Ireland certainly is a case in point. And the Israeli and the Palestinian diasporas are vibrant, they're educated people, they're passionate, they're committed. I'd like each of you to say what positive steps your respective diasporas can play in realizing movement toward a peace settlement. Uh, we have a very uh, close relationship with uh, the Jewish communities worldwide, as I assume uh, everybody knows. Uh, they care a lot about everything that takes place in Israel. And uh, I uh, do hope and I think that uh, this is the case, that uh, the majority of them, maybe all of them, with concerns, uh, support Israel it's in its endeavor uh, towards peace. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, we have to make the decisions. Uh, and uh, we hope that they will uh, support the decisions that uh, we uh, will choose to make. Uh, but we are engaging in a dialogue with them. And we are listening to uh, their opinions. And we get advice uh, uh, from every corner. And we take it uh, with, uh, with open hearts and minds, because uh, we, are, we are in many ways one. At the end of the day, Israel will have to make the decisions. The Israeli political system will have to make a decision. And I assume, certainly hope, that uh, a world jury uh, will support Israel in what decision Israel takes. Ma'am, I fully agree with you about the importance of the role of diasporas, and you're not without knowing that 50% of our people happen to be, to be living outside mandatory Palestine because we were ejected to the periphery of our homeland in 48 onwards. And I believe in the importance of their role, and today we have become the Jews of the Israelis, we are the wandering Palestinians, and we became a global tribe. You run into Palestinians from Scandinavia to Pennsylvania to California to Australia. They have a great role, and they have been extremely successful in their country of adoption. To give you an example, in Salvador, four or five years ago, there were presidential elections. The candidate of the left was Mr. Handel from Bethlehem, Palestine. The candidate of the right was uh, Mr. Saka from Bethlehem, Palestine. And I remember then commenting that whoever loses or wins, there'll be a Palestinian in the White House of San Salvador. In Belize, for example, that microstate, the prime minister of uh, Belize is today a Palestinian of origin from El Biri. At moments, he had a foreign minister from the family Schumann from Beit Hanina, just to give you examples of success stories. And I believe if we are smart and we could be smart, that demographic, geographic dispersion, we can turn it into constructive political empowerment. Uh, now, the Israelis haven't been helpful with us in their dealings with our diaspora. One, I keep telling Israelis that a community that doesn't show sensitivity to the suffering it inflicts should expect a reduction in the expression of sympathy for the suffering they have endured. Uh, they have often dealt with the refugee dimension with great insensitivity. Number two, ma'am, whenever Palestinians from the diaspora come to Palestine, to the West Bank and Gaza, to work, to invest, to visit, they are often very much harassed at airports, at the entry point in, in the bridges. And I'm sure you have become aware of the problems that some of them who came to help, to work, as teachers, professors, investors, have problems in renewing their visas, and including American 
Palestinians who do not enjoy all the privileges of being a holder of an American passport and often do not enjoy the backing of your embassies and your consulates whenever they run into unnecessary harassment. So a great role for the diaspora. Unfortunately, the Israelis haven't been helpful with the maltreatment of those who individually have come back to settle or to live or to visit, but uh, a great role which we have to tap more into. Uh, Jim? Thank you, Aaron. Uh, my name is Jim Vitarello. I'm with a group called Sharing Jerusalem. I'm also with a group called the Washington Interfaith Alliance for Middle East Peace. My, my question has, has to do with Aaron's very uh, insightful remark about improving conditions on the ground as an uh, indicator of success. I think not only an indicator, but I think it's also a uh, a direct link to the possibility of success on, in both Israel and in, in, and in Palestine in terms of getting the approval uh, of, the, of their both uh, you know, uh, sides. My point specifically has to do with the checkpoints in the West Bank, and I would like to ask both, uh, both, both ambassadors to uh, refer to it from their own points of view in terms of the growing uh, checkpoints in the West Bank, which the UN has documented it increasing by a huge amount, I forget, 150, 200, since 2005 when Abu Mazen was president, um, which seems to defy logic. At the same time, I understand that uh, Israel claims that the checkpoints are there for their security, yet uh, Israeli human rights groups, several of them have pointed out, 95% of them are there strictly to uh, uh, support and secure the settlements, not uh, Israel because they're not on the green line. Uh, but at the, at the same time, if too many of them are uh, removed maybe in the wrong places, that could also hurt Israel's security, perhaps even in Israel itself. Uh, so I'd like, that, so I'd like to uh, ask uh, Fief to, to address that issue as well. This will have to be, we're, we're over, over our time limit. Uh, this will have to be the last question and I, I urge both of our panelists to keep uh, their responses brief. Salai, do you wanna go first? Yes. Uh, with pleasure. Uh, first of all, on a factual base, uh, Israel had reduced uh, some uh, number of uh, checkpoints, uh, roadblocks recently uh, in an attempt to help facilitate Palestinian uh, movement. However, the core of the issue is terror and security. There isn't a checkpoint that is not there in order to prevent suicide bombers and other types of attackers from taking the lives of innocent civilians. And for that to change significantly, there must be a significant change on the Palestinian side in stopping terror. Uh, if for the very good reason which should be sufficient, that uh, we have to defend the lives of innocent people and for peace because uh, you should assume that if checkpoints are being removed uh, irresponsibly and the suicide bomber gets into a restaurant or a bus station or, uh, or, or a mall and takes the life of 20 people, it could have a devastating impact on the ability to move forward towards peace. So, as much as we would like to see less checkpoints, less roadblocks, the one condition that is necessary for that to happen in a significant way is for the Palestinians to once and for all take, uh, get their, their act together and seriously deal with the issue of terror. We hope that they would build the capacity to do so. As I told you before, we have some unpleasant experiences as of recent. We are not giving up on hope. We are hoping that this will develop in a positive way. We are working with them as much as we can because we want to give this uh, opportunity the best chance we can give. And we are taking risks for that. And we are taking measures that we would have otherwise not taken only to be sure that we are giving this chance or this opportunity the best chance possible. And uh, we are not only praying for that to succeed, we are acting for that to succeed. Aaron, um, 
I made once a calculation about those checkpoints, which the UN, by the way, say they have increased in the last two months by 50 more, bypassing 600 of them in the small geographic plot of the West Bank. My society loses 8 million working hours a day in delays at the checkpoint. So if we forget now the humiliation, the harassment, the oppression, and take it clinically on how many working hours, in a world where societies are measured by their economic performance, their competitivity, their productivity, we are losing 8 million hours at those checkpoints. And as you said, they are not at the borders. They are deep in Palestinian territory, dislocating the urban centers in their relationship with their rural hinterland, etc. Sarah Roy, who's a Jewish American and a Harvard scholar, has coined the concept of the de-development of Palestine speaking of Israeli deliberate policy of plunging us into economic decline. I share her opinion, by the way. We have been subjected to the policy of economic de-development. Let me, since it's our f f final uh, intervention, float with you an idea. And I believe me, uh, Salai, I hope that Israeli society will look and revise their security doctrine. I believe that there are two concepts in international relations in matters of security. One is the concept of deterrence, and the other is an underexploited concept by Thomas Schelling, which is compellence. Deterrence is a legitimate policy for a state actor. Deterrence is how to deter and dissuade a neighbor from undertaking policies that are hostile and detrimental to my interests. But compellence, which I believe describes better Israeli policy towards their, its environment. Compellence is a not legitimate policy because compellence is the way to compel and coerce your neighborhood into adopting policies that suit best your own national interest. And I believe the strategy adopted by Israelis towards Lebanon in the 80s, and it failed, towards Palestine until today, is not deterrence, which is legitimate, but compellence, the reordering through coercion of the environment in a way that suits one's interest. Now, Salah used the word prayer, which is not a word I often invoke, but I happen to pray too sometimes. I will end, ladies and gentlemen, by saying I wish for both our societies to live in peace in a two-state solution. And I, for one, even in the gloomiest of moments, always believe that Palestine will resurrect. And as Tom knows, we in Jerusalem, we have had some previous experience in resurrection. Thank you. I think it's appropriate that we conclude on that very